Hello and thanks and uh, welcome everyone. Um, today myself, uh, Animesh Singh, uh, I am the CTO and Director for Watson AI and Data Open Technology. Our responsibilities include typically you know, the work we do in open source, uh, which either we consume in Watson or the technologies from within uh, IBM and Watson which we take out in open source. Tommy, you want to introduce yourself? My name is Tommy. I'm a senior software engineer at IBM. I work mostly focused on open source. And um, my main project is actually focused on uh, how to you know, build uh, next-gen machine learning pipelines on Kubernetes. But I also contribute into how to um, defend against adversarial models attacks on you know, production machine learning models. Cool. So uh, we're going to talk about you know, how to defend against adversarial model attacks. Now, uh, this falls into the realm of uh, what within IBM we call trusted AI, and I think you know, we started on this journey around three years ago, and, and now it, uh, there is quite a bit of you know, acceptance around how to build trusted and ethical AI, right? But as you can see, the toughest thing about the power of trust is that you know, it's very difficult to build and very easy to destroy. Now, as part of that, if you see what's happening with AI, and we are in this conference, right, and, and I think it's prevalent everywhere is, uh, and we are now seeing it in our day-to-day -day lives that AI is being used in almost every uh, technology we interact with, right? Uh, whether we are submitting our resumes uh, through these uh, social media platforms, or we are, you know, are dealing with customer management in healthcare, it's prevalent. And as part of that, the focus, what we have in, uh, within IBM is like, you know, what does it take to trust a decision which is made by machine, right? Uh, I think one of the things which we squarely uh, did a lot of work was, A, is it easy to understand, right? Because a lot of the first things which you get with people who are using AI or who are, you know, consuming the output from the models, you know, how is it, uh, easy it is to understand? Can anybody tamper with it, right? Which is one of the areas where we focus on today. Uh, where essentially, you know, can you uh, tamper with AI outputs? Can you modify AI inputs? Uh, can you poison uh, training data? A lot of those uh, techniques go into that. How does it handle privacy, right? With a lot of focus on privacy and AI being prevalent on your devices, on your laptops, are you building AI in a way where your data uh, is, is not being consumed by these AI systems and, and you know, the privacy is exposed uh, in a way in which is unintended? And I think last but not the least, like, is it fair, right? And, and that essentially is a key and a major focus where, you know, is AI being biased towards a particular gender, particular religion, particular demographics? Uh, is it being fair? And, and that's another project and an area, right, where we focus a lot on. So to address these, we moved uh, some of the projects in open source. Uh, these are the projects which originated in IBM Research. Um, as I mentioned, you know, our group works on open source technologies, right? These projects originated in IBM Research and we actually help contribute and build and grow these projects. So um, as I one of the things I talked about, you know, can anybody tamper with it, which we call robustness. Uh, the toolkit which we have is called Adversarial Robustness 360 and that's where, you know, we will focus quite a bit of the talk today. Is it fair? Uh, one of the toolkits which we launched in this area is called AI Fairness 360. And then can you explain your model predictions? Can you explain your data? So the toolkit is AI Explainability 360. And the last but not the least, we have AI Fact Sheet 360. Think of it as like nutrition label on, uh, for foods, where essentially you know, all the models, they come with these fact sheets where all the provenance of what data set they were trained on, uh, what version of a framework was used, what hyperparameters were used. So the whole lineage of the model is captured into these fact sheets. Um, some high-level architecture about these projects. I wouldn't go into the details of fairness and explainability, but the core idea is that you know we work. Uh, these toolkits actually target the whole life cycle. So when you look at something like AI Fairness 360, it it has pre-processing, in-processing, and post-processing algorithms to detect bias in your data sets, uh, detect bias in your classifiers, and then you know there are post-processing algorithms once your models are deployed and if they are giving predictions, can they be detected uh, for uh, bias predictions. Similarly, the AI Explainability 360, it has you know, a very comprehensive view of being able to explain data sets, data sets features, data set samples, also being explained, able to explain your models, both at a global level as well as a local level. And when I say global level, you know, over a period of transactions, is your model you know, giving consistent 
predictions and can you explain those predictions why they are coming? And also on a per transaction basis, right, uh, can you explain those predictions? And then adversarial robustness toolbox in which, you know, I will dive in later. So what we did, you know, once we moved these projects in open source, we actually ended up contributing to LFAI and data. So Linux Foundation AI and data is a neutral organization which essentially uh, incubates a lot of the projects in the AI and data space. And all these projects are now available under that neutral governance model. So not only did we move uh, these projects in Linux Foundation AI and data, we essentially went there and you know, formed a committee, what we call you know, uh, LFAI and data trusted AI committee. And the goal of this committee is to actually bring trust, transparency, and responsibility into AI. Uh, we essentially joined hand with a lot of the companies in the space, working with Microsoft, working with DARPA, General Motors, Orange, uh, Tencent, and there are a lot of other companies, right, which are joining in terms of defining the mission, how to actually grow the principles as well as the technologies in the trusted and ethical AI space, right? So if you're interested, I will uh, really, uh, you know, uh, will be glad to have you uh, join this, uh, this mission in terms of, you know, growing the technologies as well as the principles around trusted and ethical AI. And as one of the things, right, apart from the toolkits, as I mentioned, right, the focus is on principles. So we uh, submitted, you know, and with the uh, actual uh, getting together all the group members and coming to a conclusion, what do we mean by different principles? So there were eight LFAI principles for trusted AI, which were launched. And as you can see, the acronyms actually, you know, come to the word, you know, our repeats. And that essentially goes through all these different principles, which are around secu security, which is very self-explainable reproducibility where you know you want all the lineage and the metadata as your data and AI lifecycle is going and the models are produced. Uh, equitability, that's where you know some of the fairness characteristics come in that you know the model uh, predictions are biased or not biased towards a particular group, particular individual. So a lot of those techniques go into that. Privacy again falls into the larger umbrella of AI security and, and that's one of the principles and explainability and accountability. Transparency, definitely, right, when you are actually interacting with an AI system, you should be aware that you are interacting with an AI system and not uh, being totally unaware while you are doing those work. So uh, let's talk about some of these, three of these principles, which is around security, robustness, and privacy. So security in AI, right. So one of the things, right, which we have seen over the course of uh, last two years is that, you know, there is a lot more focus uh, on security in AI, right? And typically, you know, the cybercrime uh, follow the issues of the day. And when we were looking at one of the Gartner research, right, around 600 plus executives are saying that security and privacy is one of the top blockers to using AI, right? And part of the reasons are, A, like uh, uh, around a couple of years ago, right? And even now, like the awareness of risk is low within the AI space, how security should be implemented. Uh, and an understanding of AI security is also low in terms of you know, what are the kind of techniques and tools we can implement uh, for AI security. So that essentially ends up being translated to you know, the security posture being close to zero. Now if you look at uh, where do these three uh, streams intersect, like, right, so one is essentially yes, the privacy, right? You want to ensure the privacy of data and AI models. Uh, security, right, which is essentially where we are going to focus the rest of the talk, which is, you know, how do you protect against adversarial threats, model theft, certified defenses, and evaluations? And then actually, when you are actually doing execution, uh, when these models are running on your devices and they are using techniques like federated learning, et cetera, how do you enable confidentiality and trust among collaborating parties, right? So if these models on your devices, they are using your data to further retrain themselves, and while they are transferring some of their data back, they're not taking any privacy-oriented things or any private things which should be taken back. So that comes into the execution model there. So these three different uh, streams, you know, intersect to form the private AI practice. Um, and it's not only a nice to have, uh, this is one of those things, right, which is becoming an imperative, right? So as you saw, GDPR, uh, which essentially came in and, and created heavy regulations around data, one of the consequences of that broad definition of GDPR is that also that, you know, machine learning models are also amenable to certain attacks which in uh, principle could qualify as personal data, right? So that means, you know, a lot of the provisions in GDPR are relevant to AI. 
And not only this, like yes, GDPR is already there, it's already in practice, and, and most of the technology vendors are, you know, asked to comply with it. But also, you know, European uh, um, Union and other regulation uh, are working on other regulations which are going to bring this into the mandatory space where you are going to implement and you will be required to implement some of these practices. The other part is, you know, there was a paper which was also published where a lot of the attacks, right, around model in, uh, version and membership inference attacks, they can actually, you know, reverse engineer and based on the model, they can actually get some of the bits about the sensitive data back from the model. And those are the kind of things, right, which are uh, forcing people to actually interpret GDPR and applying some of the provisions back to the AI models itself, right? So uh, the main thrust of this is that this is not only nice to have, it's becoming something which, you know, you must be doing. And pretty soon, you know, more formal regulations will be coming around it. So a very simple example of uh, what does adversarial machine learning means, right? So in this case, right, uh, some of the initial st attacks started in the financial regulation and the financial industry where, as you can see, there is an original ch check for $153. And if somebody can adversarially modify the inputs, and if you're depositing the check, uh, the bank might credit $753. Now, even though that is a bit imperceptible to the human eye, it's, it's easy to fool a model to actually interpret that one as a seven. Even more scarier example, right, which is essentially, and when we actually, you know, use this uh, through the research people, through the toolkit, you know, essentially you can fool a self-driving system to not detect a stop sign and, and create devastating consequences. But these are not only theoretical examples, right? It's actually happening in real world, right? As you can see, all these examples which are presented here coming from real world, for example, where, you know, evasion of classification in anti-virus products, which then leads to uh, ransomware being installed and, and, you know, encrypting your computer. Or, you know, real world adversarial patches for evasion attacks on cars, which then, you know, end up uh, having you lose control on the autonomous vehicle and then which leads to damages and injury. Right, similarly, like for example, in this case, right, there is an extraction of classification models to a stage evasion attack against email production system, which then leads to phishing attacks. So all these examples are real and many more are happening currently uh, where systems like these are needed. So uh, when we look at adversarial threats to machine learning, right, they can be quantified and qualified into four areas, um, what we call evasion, poisoning, uh, extraction, and inference. So essentially, you know, what we mean by evasion attacks is when an adversary tries to get access to your models by modifying inputs to the influence the model behavior. Poisoning is when there is a backdoor which is available to training data and you can actually go and poison the training data and then you are able to use the backdoor at time, sometimes later. Extraction, when you actually have some valuable models, right, which has uh, proprietary data and, you know, uh, adversaries are able to steal that proprietary model by creating different combination of queries, et cetera. And inference, which is essentially, you know, learn information on private data. So essentially being able to uh, do model inversion or reverse engineering so as to go from a model back to the data set on which it was trained. So art is a library which handles all these different use cases. And in one line, it's a Python library to actually allow, uh, which allows you to implement both attack and defense mechanisms against adversarial threats, right? It uh, provides tools to both developers and researchers, and it gives you uh, means to actually evaluate, defend, certify, and verify machine learning models and applications. And it works with a wide variety of models, right? Classification, object detection, generation, encoding, all these different kind of tasks are supported. And in some ways, it's both framework agnostic as well as framework dependent, right? You can work with different kind of deep learning uh, frameworks like TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, MXNet, or machine learning frameworks like Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, et cetera, and uh, use it across that. And even though art started with a focus on images, like when we essentially launched the tool around three years ago, the focus was on images, but over a period of time, the toolkit has actually evolved. It now uh, supports tabular and structured data, audio, video, et cetera. So as I mentioned, the focus uh, is, is definitely on both the use cases. It provides red team tools, which is essentially, you know, how do you uh, uh, do poisoning evaluation, inference evaluation, extraction, but 
as we evolved the tool, you know, we also ended up providing a lot of the blue team tools, which essentially allows you and gives you mechanisms and algorithms to defend against these attacks, right? So poison detection, adversarial training, evasion detection, all these methods and techniques are actually available within the tool. Uh, and we are not doing it alone, right? There are multiple adopters and contributors. Uh, so overall, the project has around 3,000 GitHub stars. It has been downloaded more than 150,000 times. And there are many other projects, right, which are actually now using and leveraging it and have been launched. For example, you know, Microsoft has launched a tool called Counterfeit, which essentially leverages art under the covers. <clears throat> there is a quite of extensive work we are doing with DARPA uh, over the course of last two years in terms of getting some of the algorithms and techniques into the project. Uh, there is another toolkit which has been launched called Armory, right, which allows you to package this in Docker containers and run it on cloud and scale it. And then IBM has launched another toolkit called AI Privacy Toolkit, which goes into the other areas of privacy, uh, which also leverages art, right? And there are other contributors like Intel, General Motors, University of Chicago, et cetera. And what we did uh, just last month, you know, the project actually moved into the graduation phase. So if you are aware of how do these uh, foundations, whether it's CNCF or Linux Foundation operate, uh, project gets incubated and then it matures towards the graduation and the project was uh, actually announced as a graduation candidate just last month and you know, we got some great kudos from all the different participating members who are contributing to the project. In terms of you know, uh, the actual organization of the library, and I think you know, I'll go very quickly through this. Uh, there are six main sections, attacks, as I talked about the different kind of attacks, evasion, poisoning, extraction. Defenses, where all the different kind of defense mechanisms are implemented. Estimators are essentially, you know, arts abstraction of the evaluated machine learning model, which allows you to then work with attacks and defenses. And then evaluations are provide you evaluators to actually evaluate the robustness of your models, right? And it does by generating some metrics. And these metrics are tools for quantifying, um, you know, based on certain standards which are being developed in the industry around that. Okay. And uh, very quickly, like, you know, uh, you can go to this link. It's art-demo, myblomix.net. And let me see if I have it. Here. And this is the simplest way to, to understand this, uh, where essentially, you know, you can actually select an image. For example, in this case, right, uh, the model is 92% confident that this is a Siamese cat. And then you can choose to launch one of the attacks, right? For example, you can use projected gradient descent. In this case, it is one of the uh, strongest attacks, yielding close to 100% success rate. And, you know, even with the, if there is, uh, if the strength is none, uh, you see the model is 92% confident. When we increase the strength of the attack to low, the model's confidence reduces to 4%. You go to medium, the model is now thinking, you know, this is a basketball, right? So these are the different kind of algorithms, and there are many more, and Tommy will go a bit into the details, right? So you can actually simulate, and not only it gives you attack methods, as I mentioned, you know, there are a lot of defense methods as well. So for example, you can use something like spatial smoothening, uh, think of it as like, you know, uh, uh, blurring some of the pixels of your image, right, so as to remove the pixel surface area. And if you implement one of those defense mechanisms and you increase the strength to low, the model is back to 76% confidence that is a CME scan, right. So that's a quick introduction to art. And with that, I will pass on to Tommy to talk about, you know, a bit more about how we are using this uh, with some of the other toolkits. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Amanesh. So, um, so now we have showcased how we could use art to actually um, showcase um, the way how we uh, do our server attacks on like, existing machine learning models. Um, so next we wanna go over like, how we wanna integrate this um, trusted AI projects into um, the Kiflo project to automate our workflows as part of um, our machine learning life cycles. So Kiflo is an open source project that actually uh, provider for data scientists to do their end-to-end -end workflows on Kubernetes, right? Um, so a data scientist typically could um, use, let's say, Jupyter Notebooks to train or like uh, develop machine learning models on Kubernetes, and then also like uh, incorporate any like training operators to train their models and um, 
orchestrate their whole workflow using like pipelines, and everything um, could be run on Kubernetes on top of Kubeflows. And today we want to focus on like two major projects. One is Kubeflow pipelines for orchestrating your you know end-to-end -end workflows on Kubernetes, and KSER for serving your machine learning models on top of Kubernetes uh, as a production uh, environment. And uh, so now let's go over like what a Kubeflow pipeline could do. Kubeflow pipeline provide a very easy way for user to containerized implementations of ML tasks on top of Kubernetes. So any users, once they build the components, they could just pretty much could put any open source prepared components on the fly. Um, they could easily create any kind of components with any code uh, because it's containerized, so it, it's like language agnostic at this point. Um, so any runtime framework data type could be used within this task. And furthermore, because it's run on Kubernetes, you could also leverage like Kubernetes like objects, let's say a volume or sequence across the whole uh, organization or whole teams. And once you have you know, defined your containerized tasks, you could easily like, compose your pipelines using like, a simple Python DSL. And once you compose a pipeline, any of your runs could configure with any input parameters uh, on top of the Kubeflow pipelines environments. And once you have this automated pipeline be ready, um, you could always you know, automate and schedule this pipeline to help you um, automate all your machine learning um, workflows on a daily task or a periodic um, way. And with the beauty of Kubeflow pipelines, we could simply just like, plug in any you know, trusted AI components as an individual task to evaluate how well our models is been um, doing or once the um, training has been done. So in this case, uh, you look at the examples on the uh, top right corners. Um, someone could be processing their data and training their data and training their models based on that data. And once the model is being uh, trained, a data science might want to take a look into how that model is be being performed against like, robustness attacks. So in this case, we just could plug in a simple um, component that you know, evaluate how good this model is being doing. And based on the results, we could determine whether or not we should you know, deploy this model into production or retain and do further development until we say it's production ready. And once you think the uh, model is production ready, we could simply also move on to a different project uh, called KServe. Um, KServe used to be part of the Kubeflow project and now has been graduated into uh, the Linux Foundation AI. Um, and KServe is um, first founded by uh, Google, Seldom, IBM, Bloomberg, and Microsoft. And its goal is actually to do like serverless ML influencing, canary rolls out, model explanation, which we will focus uh, later on. And optionally, you can also pre-process and post-process your uh, model payloads on top of like, uh, these whole platforms. And this whole thing is actually built on top of Kubernetes, uh, and you could use ESQ and Knative to route your um, connections and, um, and do like, multiple ways of like, um, inference different models and do different explanation on the fly. And it's very um, robust and uh, pluggable platforms. And with the beauty of case server, we could just plug in any of the components to help us to evaluate models uh, once the model is actually production and running. Um, one of the uh, key feature of case server is that you could actually have an, another like, uh, kind of deployments on top of like, um, your machine learning models. And that explainer could be either fairness, experimentality, or a very robustness toolbox. And it would basically just use the prediction results on your uh, models, and it doesn't have the access or any, you know, like your model files because it could actually just predict the um, black box attacks on top of the, you know, uh, prediction results. And this could give you like um, a evaluation on how a, just a regular user could, you know, perform this kind of robustness attacks on top of your uh, production models. And with this, um, I would go into show you like a short demos on how you could integrate, you know, adversarial robustness toolbox on top of Kubeflow pipelines. So as we just um, mentioned before, like a robustness uh, component could be easily just plugged in as an individual step to evaluate machine learning um, model outputs. And with this example, we're going to focus on the adversarial robustness toolbox, whereas um, we will actually perform a what we call a white box test. So we actually take the model files. Um, and along with like, information like the loss function and optimizer to perform a uh, fast gradient assignment method attacks. So this basically just uh, based on um, the, how your gradient has been calculated in the models and evaluate a very quick attack to see how well the um, model is actually performed in this case. 
Um, so let me just switch to the um, quick demos. So for anyone who want to check out how this you know, like, uh, algorithm is being implemented, you could uh, always go to the Trusted AI uh, organization underneath. Uh, under the adversarial business toolbox, we have all the codes open source. You can check how it's been implemented and all the research paper is behind this. Um, and also you could uh, pick different kind of adversarial attacks. In this case, uh, we're using like, the uh, uh, fast uh, gradient sign attacks, but you could also have other more robust attacks based on what kind of framework it supports and what kind of you know, like capabilities you want to do the attacks on. And also with like uh, the black box attacks, it also means like um, some of these attacks, it doesn't have to base on your model graph, how it computes, it could just base on your prediction results. So anyone could have access to just any the prediction on the models could actually perform this kind of attacks. And there's also more um, different kind of attack that animals have mentioned before, like portion attacks, extraction attacks, and inference attacks on different aspects of the machine learning models could be vulnerable too. So with this, uh, I was going to showcase how you could integrate um, something uh, like this um, irreversible robustness toolbox on top of Qflow pipelines. So in Qflow pipelines, when you finish like, um, you know, let's say training your models, you could simply plug in this simple, you know, every server person evaluation, you know, task to just take the output of the model files and evaluate how, how well it's going to do. Um, and with this, uh, simply you, you could see all the um, parameters being depopulated with like um, how this model is being trained. You could see like some, some information like the optimizer and the loss function so it knows how the gradient is being evaluated as well. Um, and with this pipeline, what this pipeline is going to do is going to like train a simple model, right? Um, and then behind the scenes, um, it will also train an adversarial robustness model based on the uh, model you have trained and use the adversarial robustness model to evaluate how well your um, robustness um, uh, record is. is. Um, since it usually takes about five to 10 minutes to run, so I will show you like some of the previous results we have been done. So in this step, we usually they just uh, finish uh, training uh, machine learning models on Kubernetes and store as in the volumes. And once the um, model is being trained, it would just take the uh, model from the volume and perform another area um, model training on top of it. And basically these area server models using the uh, fast gradient sign methods, it were able to simply um, train it very fast and you could see with these attacks, uh, the original data sets have 85% accuracy rate on average. Uh, but with every several examples, you actually like, get this down to like point one, uh, 16%, so which is like, very low. And also the um, uh, accuracy rate on average is actually uh, lower by 24%, which is significantly lower. Um, and because we're doing a very fast you know, attacks, um, uh, the actual adversary model has to do a big you know, uh, perturbation, so it has changed the pixel quite a lot in order to achieve this. But of course, if we kind of train this every series models like uh, for longer, this per, uh, perturbation time could be, uh, this perturbation pixel could be, gets much lower and still perform like a similar uh, kind of result on this particular models. And this is how you could easily automate, you know, like um, every serial person check on top of your development cycles. But how about once you have like um, deployed a model in production and how you evaluate those um, robustness when you don't have access to the model file itself. Um, so next we are going to get in um, how we could integrate this um, methods into like KSERV, which is serving you know, machine learning models or in production. Um, as we mentioned before, like um, to plug in this, you, you could simply use the KSERV explainer methods um, to just plug in this tool um, without any coding. And in this um, demos where we're going to show, uh, we we're going to show using a, uh, what we call a square attack methods. With this method, you actually don't need to access the model file itself, so you can perform a black box attack. And because uh, we don't need like, too much information about the models, all you need to do is just say what is the model name, so you could actually know where it uh, call the prediction, like get the model prediction from. There are several types of the type of attack you want to perform, in this case, it's the uh, square method attacks. Um, and how many iterations? The more iteration you use, the more accuracy the attack will be and then how many classes is in this um, uh, prediction result. So the, um, the attacker know like what other class you want to like, uh, 
uh, skew the, uh, the prediction output to. And to actually just run this on Kubernetes is pretty simple. So uh, when you deploy a, uh, models on top of like a KSERF, you only have to define um, you know, the basic CRD format and it define uh, predictors. And to incorporate these new features for uh, every server robustness attack, you only need to add this extra explainer sections, specify you want to do an every server robustness check, art, and the type of attacks, and how many classes is in this um, particular uh, um, models. And behind the scenes, what it's going to do is that once the um, you know, CRD has been deployed, uh, it will create a art explainer. It's actually training in every server robustness um, models based on the predictor models you have deployed on Kubernetes. And when a client actually do a request, uh, first of all, you will go into the instill ingress gateway to check is the explainer going to um, evaluate that and see how good is the current prediction is. And once the prediction output is come back, it actually do more sample evaluation based on the square attack methods, uh, change the um, picture files and see how much attack it needs to actually change the, um, you know, uh, the original picture into like something in, in a different class. And with this, uh, I will just show you how it actually done in actions. So, uh, because we have to pre-deploy the models, so um, for this demo, we already um, deployed um, our you know, machine learning models on the clouds and also uh, with the explainer on the cloud as well. And they don't share the same volume in this case. So the, technically, the, what the explainer is going to do um, is, is the same thing what the user could uh, able to do in this case. Um, and with this, we could simply just run a um, simple script to just do a simple predictions. And behind the scene, we are actually going through the explainer. So the explainer actually takes the same picture as well and see how much you know, um, pixel it has to modify in order to change this into a different class, change the prediction we start in the different class. As, as you can see, like, the original picture we try to like, predict is number three um, for this MNES handwritten um, data set. And we, in this case, we could see like, it changed about um, you know, 30, 40 percent of the pixel just by a little bit. Um, and it, it could to trick the class into classify as a uh, number nine. So you could see like uh, from like uh, external attackers, they could easily you know, change certain type of pixels and able to like trick around um, how the um, models see this as a different class. Right, um, and with this, we will conclude all of our demos. Um, you have any you know, question you wanna look at how this, you know, all this algorithm has been implemented, you could always go to our GitHubs and we have Slack channel to answer all your questions. And uh, this project is uh, all on LFAI, so you can also come into LFAI uh, community meeting as well to ask any question um, that you have. And uh, last but not least, uh, we're also able to like, uh, leverage like, IBM AI health checks on all these capabilities. Um, so you have other, other you know, questions about, let's say, drift bias model risk, you can also like, come to us and ask us any questions. Um, so that is the uh, end of the session. Is there any questions from the audience? Thank you, Tommy. Thanks, Shia, if you guys have any questions. Okay. I have one, Manimesh, for you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, do, do you think that this kind of new approaches or libraries like ours will change the way we are building models today? And when it's kind of you know, relevant to apply this kind of approach? Is it like early as possible or do we have to wait to be in production having uh, detected threats and real life threats and data? Uh, very good question. So I think they definitely are, are changing. Right? Anyways, can, you, can you speak in the yeah. microphone, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So in the context, I think the question was, you know, will these libraries change the way we are building machine learning models or will it be more around, you know, uh, you come later in the life cycle when these models are deployed. I think it's both, right? So for some of the techniques which are available, like adversarial training, you can actually, you know, train your models with adversarial samples to actually, you know, derive the accuracy as you are training and ensure that, you know, how is it actually working uh, with adversarial generated samples and what kind of output it is producing. We actually produce metrics like clever metrics and other scores which as part of the training conclusion gives you 
the whole metrics, uh, as Tommy was showing with the Qflow pipelines, that you know whether your model is vulnerable to adversarial attacks or not. But assuming you have not done that and you have deployed models in production and, and you want to come, right? So there are a lot of defense mechanisms which are available, right? So as he was showing in the context of Kserve, Kserve is a platform where you deploy models in production, but then you have black box methods which can just look at the incoming inputs and the outgoing outputs, right? And by analyzing that, right, it can actually generate scores whether, you know, the model has been adversarially or the inputs which are coming to your blacks models, they are adversarially modified on that. So uh, what we are seeing in the, in the field is a lot of people are now incorporating them as part of their training life cycle itself, the model build life cycle, where uh, these toolkits, as you saw one of the examples where Microsoft has launched a tool called Counterfeit, right, which is essentially, uh, they are also leveraging heavily in their training life cycles. We are working very closely with DARPA and a lot of the models which are being created there, they are actually leveraging this in training life cycle before producing the model. Maybe we'll take a last question. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question would be, so currently, just on the defense side, does ART plan on, um, and plan on incorporating cryptographic primitives as part of the defense process? Um, so like, uh, does ART plan on also incorporating cryptographic primitives and cryptographic techniques as part of your defense? It, it is not the focus currently, right? But if, if you think, you know, these are some of the techniques which should be developed there, right? We'll definitely will consider, right? So if, if you want to either come in the Slack channel or, you know, join one of these meetings, right? Uh, but crypto as, as a field hasn't been a focus currently so far with art, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>